Yeah, uh, nothing unique um, other than the usual, you know, sore here. Maybe a guy turns an ankle, and I'm just throwing out. A, I don't have anything specific, but nothing than your usual nicks and knacks. You, you'd love to play a game in the spring when your team is 100%, and it probably never happens, not only to us, but everybody in the country. Uh, but fortunately for guys like Booker with a foot injury, C. Scott, uh, Jared Dickey uh, suffers a, a minor fracture in his hand. And then some setbacks we had, really a lot of them stemmed from guys just not being able to stay on the field with that rash of illnesses we had in the semester. Um, right now, most of that is behind us. So we feel good about the fact that we're out there, everyone's present on day one today. Uh, but we also have a sense of urgency that we've got a lot of work to do. With Halverson, I, I know you've spoken about him in radio interviews and, and whatnot. Seems like he's doing fine. Is is he on a load management type of deal, or or how full go is he at this point? Yeah, no more than the other guys. I, I think with he and um, Joyce, um, both of them have not pitched competitively in quite some time, and um, they have faced hitters uh, about a week ago is and when it would be, and then they'd throw again again in the scrimmage tomorrow. So. Uh, we'd be foolish, they'd be foolish if they didn't say they need to kind of get a little cozy out there uh, with some outings. But otherwise, those guys have utilized the free time that they've had. And it's tough when a young kid gets injured. Uh, but I think most coaches nowadays try and spin it and realize, OK, if you can't do this, it stinks. But it does mean you can dedicate more time to this. And both those guys have just been on a mission literally from the instant they had an injury and had the few moments of being emotional about it and then just gotten after it. And they're two as physical of pitchers as you're going to find in the SEC. And I think that's going to support their health. How different is the, the pitching competition, I guess, going to this season, whereas last year we're talking about maybe six guys and now it just probably is three in what order are they falling into? Yeah, I think this deal's a little different because you got some guys that are a little more proven. Blade was sore at the beginning of last year, and it just opened up the door for a lot of guys that, I don't know, you'd call them wild cards, but um, you know, this time of year, maybe two weeks, a little closer to the season a year ago, or like, I guess we're going to lean on these freshmen pretty good. And, and any coach, any sport, you, you're going to have at least a cloud over your head or a bubble over your head of different thoughts, like which way is this going to go? How is he going to handle pressure situations and things like that? I, I think for the bulk of the competition, we kind of know what we got. It's just a matter of where do we think guys help the team most, and then how are the guys going to capitalize on the opportunities we give them starting in Arizona and then thereafter. And then the freshmen, uh, somebody's going to jump up, and it may be a couple guys that jump up and grab – important innings, uh, but it's an interesting class. It's probably um, depth-wise as good of a class as I've been around pitching-wise. Uh, but also, I don't know if you can call it COVID at this point, but we're, we're blessed with some good arms. Those freshmen are going to need to be patient and, and understand there's a progression, a natural progression here. Um, Dolander is a good example. Last year, um, he had a great year. You look at his freshman year. Um, like most freshmen, he needed to go through some things and learn some things. So um, the bulk of the guys are experienced. We'll find out where we think they fit in. And then the freshman class is just going to be fun to work with. And I know they're ambitious, so we'll see which couple, two, three guys uh, jump up and are able to grab some really vital innings for us. How much of that competition in the field do you want or expect to be decided by the time you all begin play in Arizona? And how much is that going to continue on in the pre-conference slate? This team has a different story to write than other teams, again, across the country, but in particular on this campus than last year, the year before, year before. And I think something that this team has is a little bit more open competition uh, position player wise. We said that at the beginning of last year, and then some guys just flat out took ownership of some of those spots. I mean, Jarrell was one of three or four candidates to be the second baseman, and he didn't give us much choice starting on day one. Um, so maybe that'll happen with this club, but I think more so, um, for instance, we go to Arizona, you're probably going to see three different starting lineups in the outfield uh, for those three, three spots. And one guy might start in the outfield in DH or, you know, Dickey's full, fully capable of catching. As of now, we, he's, we've kind of steered him more towards the outfield just as of now. Uh, we've only been practicing a little bit, so some combinations there. Kind of on that catcher position, how important is it to have three or you know guys ready to rock and roll? That way, you can stay fresh. One can go to DH, and just quality of 
of depth of the position and how is uh, Taylor kind of leading that group? Yeah, no, it affects, uh, it affects how you feel in May and June where if we're fortunate enough, um, I forget what it was. Uh, we, we had an umpire explaining a rule to our guys and he brought up, you know, when you get in a regional, when you get in a super, that's not guaranteed. Um, we're not guaranteed to go to Hoover. Uh, but you would like to have plan A be, hey, we're going to play deep into May, play in June. Um, so it's important how your body feels then. And, you know, we're not NBA guys, so we don't need load management. But at that position where you're squatting, depth is crucial. And it's very challenging to go through a whole year just being healthy. I mean, Coach Elander, when he was catching at TCU, he jumped and laid out full extension uh, uh, against uh, a team and landed on a bat weight, I believe, on the on-deck circle. So he was out for a few days. So as tough as he is, and you see how physical he is, it's tough to go a whole year without kind of missing a game because of something pops up here and there. So depth is huge. And Charlie's certainly taken ownership. I think last year, him being called upon in the regional and the reaction he got from the fan base um, and how well he played, too, gave him a lot of confidence. And he's, he's ridden that horse, so to speak, uh, to start off this year and, and take some ownership of that position. But by no means is he our starting catcher on opening day. Uh, but he will be, uh, you know, he will start in Arizona at some point. I feel confident in that. Just following up about the catcher position, just how would you handicap those guys you have in there? And what sort of statement of confidence in that room is it that you feel good about Dickie playing in the outfield? Yeah. Is, is that a golf term, yeah. that version? I don't even know what that means in golf. <laughs> and I don't think I want to know because then I'll start playing golf and I'll be mad that I stink and, and you guys won't ever see me again. I'll be, I'll be practicing. But, no, I, I think you got a unique – that's what we want is when you recruit, um, kids should want to be challenged. They should want competition. But it's kind of better if for pitchers in, in particular, hey, if a guy does well, he's going to play. And at that catching spot, you can only have one guy, but we like to use two. We started out using Landon Gray and Pavoloni. We got guys like Jared Dickey who can run, he can pinch hit, he can play the outfield. Uh, he's gotten better behind the plate. Um, unlike him being a left-handed hitter, Charlie and, or Chuck is, uh, you know, obviously a right-handed hitter, as is Cal Stark. Um, you know, Cal can do a lot of different things that we feel are good matchup-wise. Uh, everybody throws a little different. And then you throw in Ryan Miller, who's still learning the position. He's athletic enough to play corner infield. Um, and he probably takes the most impressive BP out of anyone we have. So it's kind of nice. Each guy's different. Um, if you see two guys is very, very similar, you might just kind of steer towards the guy that's, that's a better version of player A, player A. Uh, but it's, it's a nice complement of guys we got back there. Tony, a couple years ago, it was kind of Chad Dallas. Last year, Drew Beam, just guys that you came back after the winter talking about it as having a big role. Anyone like that standing out right now? I, I just like uh, – you, you'd like to think the younger guys are more eager with their work ethic and almost kind of overdo it. You know, they hang out in the cage for an hour and a half when it's kind of like time to go home after hour one. Um, and, and Reese Chapman and Dylan Dryling are two freshmen that showed up, and it was like, okay, they did their work. Um, like, like you'd expect. for, But the older guys, you never know if they're going to get complacent or I've been here or I'll catch up. And, and Griffin Merritt and Andrew Lindsay are two guys that are older um, to the point where we tease them in team meetings how old they are. Um, they're both on the, the same level as Camden Sewell and Christian Scott. And yet they both showed signs of the most amount of progress, if that makes sense. When they left and then came back, they were two of the guys that had the most notable difference just in how their bodies looked, how they moved around, and how well prepared they seemed when they first picked up a baseball or started swinging the bat. I guess with those freshman outfielders, how do they compare with guys like Jordan Beck and Drew Gilbert when those two were freshmen because they kind of came in with the same profile as a recruit? And how have you seen them grow since they got on campus? Yeah, yeah, we, it's an opportunity to bring up one thing. We kind of thought we had a three-headed monster out there, and we still could. Um, with Stanwich and then Dryling and Chapman, who I mentioned. Now, Stanwich, uh, for what would be good to everyone respect his privacy, although I don't think it's anything to hide, is going to take a semester uh, to get some things sorted out. And then ideally is back here in the fall to join his two buddies. Um, and when I say back in the fall, you know, with the team doing his thing. Um, but those three kids are as talented as Drew and, and Jordan. And now to kind of narrow the focus to the two I mentioned, 
uh, guys that deserve playing time as of now in Arizona, Reese and Dylan have to be included in that conversation. Uh, like Drew and Jordan, they're finally the wave of guys we're getting that say no to the draft. And, and not that it's wrong to say yes to the draft, but the SEC is littered with guys who could have went pro out of high school but are attracted to the conference. And uh, fortunately, those numbers of guys are starting to stack up for us. And that's the easiest way for me to describe Dylan and Reese is they're capable of doing that out of high school. At the same time, they're young, so they have a lot to learn. Uh, exciting future for those two guys in those spots. And, and to be honest with you, they should be thinking the future's now. Just all the new guys on this team and new players playing big roles, do you worry about trying to find an identity or is that something you just expect to come naturally over the course of the season? Yeah, I worried about at the first pitch banquet uh, not remembering someone's full name. So we had them take the microphone and they introduced themselves and that was an awesome event. Uh, I guess this is a decent opportunity to thank everybody that came because our, we're outgrowing each building we go to each year, and we were in a huge space this year on campus, a beautiful spot in the Union, and we might have, we maybe have outgrown that. Um, so pretty cool. Uh, but no, those guys all did a good job, and that was a night where, because they had the mic in their hands, some guys were able to do some things and, and kind of come out of their shell and show who they are. And that's really all it's about as far as finding yourself or finding a team image. Uh, we can hand a T-shirt out to them if we want that says, we're the Vols, we do this. Um, some people think we're villains or whatever, so great, throw a T-shirt on. That, that doesn't mean you're going to be a certain way. Who you are every day is who you are. And uh, I think there's a noticeable difference in some of those guys the second semester. They realize when Frank says this, um, he's not only teasing you, but he's kind of getting a point across that this is an area you need to get better. Or if I kind of bring a guy up in a team meeting with a joke included, it might actually be my way of praising him or, or saying that he should be confident in this area. You know, just different examples are, are not easy to illustrate. They're going through my head. So day in and day out, they just need to come become comfortable. And this team is this team. And I, I like the unique challenges this team has that are different from the 2020 roster. And, uh, you know, I bring that up. The 2020 roster, I don't know where they had us. But that was the only time I've been a part of a team where we're like, we, we kind of got something that no one knows yet. For instance, Crochet, a guy that can go straight to the big leagues. That team would have been deserving of a really high ranking. I think this year, maybe because of the 20 team and the 21 team, so on and so forth, this team probably has been bolstered up a little bit too much. And uh, we need to center our attention on not, do we fit in that top crop? Well, first of all, you're not going to know till conference play anyway. Um, but start channeling our energy to who are we, what do I need to do for us to be the best version of us, and we're right in the middle of that deal. Lots of leaders from last year's locker room, and I know it's early and you did have fall, but has there been any kind of leaders emerge and kind of take ownership of that role? Yeah, I don't know what Griffin will do, and I don't, I don't look at the internet stats other than if we're kind of trying to make a certain decision or stuff. I, we got our own little group of stats that we do, probably like Coach Barnes does, uh, stats that maybe aren't even on the, uh, on the ticker tape in the arena. Um, so, you know, having said that, regardless of what he does, I, I'm astounded at how quickly he became a leader when he wasn't even here last year. Um, so I think that's a guy that fills that role. I think Jared Dickey's been itching to be that guy. Christian Moore has such a strong personality, you can almost feel it coming off of him. And he's still finding out that that's, that's a – other people, that's what they feel. So have an idea of how you want that to come off. And uh, so I, I think there's some leadership there. And then, you know, Blake Burke was such a good teammate last year in a year where he should be starting at first base. But you got a 39-year-old in Luke Lipsius uh, playing there, so he's got to bite his time. And, and, and probably more than most sophomores, it's kind of like I, I, I want some ownership of this thing. So those are just a few examples in that area. And then the pitching is kind of easy to talk about. I mean, guys now can say, I've been there. I know what this looks like. This is how you do it. And it kind of all filters up to Camden Sewell, who – I wish Camden Sewell now could watch a videotape of Camden Sewell just every day in the dorm and at the field as a freshman. It's, a, it's almost a different human being. And not that he was in a bad place then. Uh, he contributed for us and was a great, you know, great player, great teammate. But now it's a deal where 
you almost kind of feel like including him in some of the coaching staff, some of the coaching staff meetings, not not all. That left side of the infield with Maui and Zane. I know, I know Zane had a roller coaster of a fall, but how have you seen those two guys adjust now that the the season is here? And, and do you feel like that left side is going to be pretty solid defensively with Trey and, and Cortland moving on? Sure. Well, you, you got the young in there, and you'd like to think up until a certain age, you don't have to deal with real life crap. You, you, you'd you'd like kids to be protected and shielded from some things. And uh, certainly not his fault, just a, a bad set of circumstances for Zane where this happened, this happened, this happened, then he gets sick and he has time away and, and all this while he's trying to transition into a, a new environment. Um, so it's so awesome to just see a smile on his face and uh, kind of become one of the guys is probably his main goal right now because he, you know, he's, he can swing, he can play defense, he knows the league. Um, you know, now his body is kind of where it needs to be with Coach Q. Again, a couple illnesses is a setback and time away uh, last semester. But he had to deal with stuff that even an adult shouldn't have to all in one semester. And I got to think if anyone's eager to be out there on the field, it's him. And then Maui, um, you know, is a, a super lovable kid. And everybody knows he's highly skilled. Um, but same thing, you're wrapped up in a culture and an experience for two years. You, you kind of feel like that's who you've become. And now you got to reverse it. It's it's one thing about the portal. I don't know if I should say this, but so, sometimes you got to you got to take everything into consideration. Um, maybe the grass is greener on on uh, our side in his instance because there was a coaching change. But you, you don't just step on a campus and just because you're a good player, all of a sudden, bam, here I am. There, there's some time. And uh, again, refreshing to see how he interacts and how he goes about his business with some of the things we do as opposed to first semester. And not that he was doing anything wrong, and he's certainly well-schooled by Coach Price's program coming in here, but it's a new environment, and those two guys need to reflect what we got going on, uh, and they're starting to do that. How, how important was that NCA vote to make that volunteer assistant eventually a paid position, and how overdue was that to happen? Yeah. Um, that That's... That's a tough one to answer. Um, I, I said on the radio off the cuff the first time I was asked about that, uh, do you want me to answer honestly or, or you know, and pay ode to, to the great Mike Leach, who we're all missing, who, who had some great outtakes, um, or give the politically correct answer. But honestly, it's somewhere in between. It's, it's so great for the NCAA to step up and realize these guys need benefits and they need security health-wise, and then they're putting up in just as many hours is all the other coaches. Um, so for them to be compensated the right way is huge. And then how you become, how you're, well, I probably got different jobs because of recruiting stuff. And if you're not allowed to go recruit, how can you move up the ladder? There's only a few ways to do it. So really great for the individuals that will be hired across the country. And then even at a mid-major, if they can't pay that guy, you could still fill a role and give a young kid an opportunity to prove himself like I might, if without luck, I, I would have been in that situation. So there's a ton of great things that come out of it. And then there's always two sides to the argument. Um, it'd be great to have an additional coach. So I've, got, I've gotten emails. Some, some people that are in baseball don't even realize yet. The volunteer position will go away and a full-time position will be added. It was kind of worded in a quirky way in a lot of articles that came out when that first happened. You know, hey, this guy's now going to switch into that. Well, that's not how it's going to work. Everyone's going to get an opportunity to hire somebody. And then the volunteer position, uh, for some good reasons and some, you know, like I said, you'd love to have an additional coach, will we'll evaporate. Thank you all.